Father, the great truth of the Bible is that Christ has come to overcome and to defeat Satan, to destroy his works once and for all. And so, Father, tonight as, as we move into our final message, as we're talking about the final defeat of Satan and the restoration of your people to face-to-face -face communion with you, may your Spirit touch our hearts and may we have a genuine experience with you tonight. Open our hearts as we open your word. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, we continue our series, Four for Faith. And as you look at the screen, I would say that the answers to humanity's four central questions, origin, meaning, morality, destiny, origin, why am I here? From the hand of God, meaning, or origin, where am I from? You're from the hand of God, meaning, why am I here? To glorify God, it says in the Bible, be ye therefore holy because I am holy. Morality, how shall we live? Be ye therefore holy for I am holy. Destiny, where are we going? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And so the answers to these questions are beginning to emerge, I would say, with compelling force. Now, we've spent time on Revelation. That was the opening message. We've looked at the resurrection. That was the second, redemption. And tonight, restoration. Our sermon titles so far have been, God, are you there? Do you care? The Word, Alive and Kicking, The Sabbath, The Rest of the Story, and this evening, Advent, More Than a Name. Advent, More Than a Name. How many of you, by a raising of hands, consider yourself, yourselves to be Adventists? Raise your hand. You're an Adventist, okay? I love to preach evangelistic meetings, and, and one of my favorite things to do is we come toward the close of those meetings, and we've already covered the Sabbath, and we've already covered the Second Coming. I like to ask people, I say, you know, beloved, just as we get our meeting started this evening, I'm just wondering, how many of you believe that Saturday is God's Sabbath? Go ahead and raise your hand. You believe Saturday is, in, in, just like you're doing now, seven, non-Seventh-day Adventists all over the auditorium will raise their hands. So yeah, I believe Saturday is God's Sabbath. And I'll say, okay, put your hands down. Now, now, how many of you believe that Jesus is coming soon? That is to say you believe in the advent of Jesus, the soon return of Jesus. Go ahead and raise your hands. And j just as what's happening now, hands go up all over. And so I say, now, now listen to what you've just told me. I ask you if you believe that Saturday was the Sabbath. You've said yes. I ask you if you believe that Jesus is coming soon. You believe in the advent. You said yes. That makes you Seventh-day Adventists. Are you with me? And this, this sort of, you can see it all over the auditorium with non-Adventists, the light starts to come on. Oh, so that's what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Beloved, the Advent is the coming of the Lord. It's not just a culture of people who eat veggie links. Can someone say amen? amen. Uh, when we talk about being an Adventist, th this is, uh, this should be the very... How do, you, how, how do I want to say this? This is the very essence of what it means for, for us as Christians. We believe that Jesus, our Savior, our King, is soon to return and take us home. Now, now being an Adventist should definitionally impact every area of our lives. A amen? Amen. If we really believed, and I think many of us do, that Jesus is soon to return, that is going to have a determinative impact on every decision that we make, from entertainment choices to relationship choices to how we spend our time to how we spend our money. This is the way I like to say it. If you were accused in a court of law of being an Adventist, I don't mean a cultural Adventist, but, but someone who actually believes that Jesus is coming soon. So, so this accusation has been raised against you in a court of law, and someone looks and says, he is an Adventist. She is an Adventist. She believes in the soon return of her Lord. What I want to know is, if that was said about you in a court of law, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Tonight we're looking at restoration. Restoration, according to the dictionary definition, is really simple. It's the act of returning something to its former owner, place, or condition. If you've lost your wallet, and you look, oh, it's not in your pocket, it's restored to you when it's back in your pocket. If a child has been lost, or a dog has ran away, when it's, when it's restored to its parents, when it's restored to its owner, then, then it's been put back into its original place. Restoration is the act of returning something to its original, to its what did I say, everyone? Its original owner or its original place or its original condition. Think about the restoration of cars. 
You see these cars? In fact, I just saw one the other day here on the streets of Red Deer, a beautiful old car that, that, that looked just as though it had rolled off the showroom floor maybe 50 or 60 years ago. Well, I can assure you that that car probably does not look like that uh, uh, because it's been that well taken care of. If it's an old enough car, likely what happened is someone went to a junkyard, someone went to a parts yard, and they found an old, rusty, dilapidated car, and they restored it to its original condition. Does that make sense, everyone? Yes or no? So restoration is, is to bring something back to its original place, its original owner, or its original condition. I want to go on record as saying that I am a, a firm believer that God has committed a special gift to this church in the writings of Ellen White. Can someone say amen by that? Amen. Now, I also want to just be very aware of the fact that for some people, sadly, 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 the writings of Ellen White have been used as a club to beat you over the head with a bunch of don'ts. Beloved, this is, a, this is an abuse of the writings of Ellen White. It's not a proper use of her writings. You could do that with the Bible. You could look up only the negative things in the Bible and, and you could sort of beat people over the head with that. The reality is, is that if you will read the writings of Ellen White for yourself, you will find that they are absolutely, totally saturated with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with good news. Are there prohibitions in there? Sure there are prohibitions, but there are prohibitions all over the Bible. Do not reject Ellen White because of an improper use of her by someone who was frankly using her in an inappropriate way. This is what I like to tell people. Water can be used to drown people. But you don't stop drinking water because someone has been drowned in water. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Amen. Beloved, be intelligent. Surely there are people in this room or someone in this room who has been on the receiving end of an inappropriate use of the writings of Ellen White. But I want you to know as someone who is a convert because of the gospel-centered nature of the writings of Ellen White, go back like it was said of Frosted Flakes a long time ago. They came out with Frosted Flakes and they said, try them again for the first time. If you have been on the receiving end of a bad situation with Ellen White, I would encourage you to try her again for the first time. Amen. Go back to those writings with your eyes open. One of my favorite books that she's written is Desire of Ages. In Desire of Ages, page 824, a marvelous compendium on the life of Christ is this remarkable sentence, page 824, the very essence of the gospel is restoration. That is to say, the core of what the gospel is, is restoration. Well, what's restoration? It's to return something to its original owner or place or condition. And so the very essence, the core, the, the kernel, the nucleus of what the gospel is, is to restore something to its original place, its original owner, and its original condition. Can you say amen? amen. Powerful. And here the, the gospel becomes directional. I want to say that again. The gospel becomes directional. God doesn't just forgive us our sins to leave us wallowing in our sins. God forgives us our sins for the purpose of bringing us from where we were to a place where He wants us to be. He wants to restore us, not just forgive. Forgiveness is central to the gospel, but restoration is the very essence of the gospel. Now, with that in mind... Let's read this marvelous statement from Steps to Christ, page 17. This, this demands the question then, if the essence of the gospel is to restore mankind to his original owner, to his original place, to his original condition, then what was his original condition, owner, and place? Man was originally endowed with noble powers and a well-balanced mind. He was perfect in his being and in harmony with God. Anyone in here this evening perfect in their being? Not a one of us. And yet, this is how God made man. Remember there in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says he saw all that he had made, and behold, it was what, everyone? It was very good. And, and man was included in that very goodness. He was in harmony with God. Now, what we mean by that is not in the same way that you can be in harmony with God tonight. When Adam was in harmony with God, Adam in his innocence could bear the unmuted glory of God because there was no sin in him. God could come into the garden and Adam would be there in his innocence and he could bear it. There's no shame in him. In fact, the last verse of Genesis chapter 2 says that Adam and Eve were naked and they weren't ashamed. 
Now, I'm going to go so far as to say that if God put in an appearance tonight here, in the same way He put in appearances there in the Garden of Eden before the fall, it would not be a happy experience for us. If God decided to show up tonight in His unmuted glory, it would not be a sweet experience for any one of us. It would be, in fact, a terminal experience for all of us. That is to say, the last thing you ever experienced. But for Adam and Eve, such was not the case. Prior to sin, God could come walking literally into the very immediate presence of Adam, and Adam could bear it. That's what's meant by being in harmony with God. His thoughts were pure. His aims holy. And I would add, his thoughts were always pure. His aims were always holy. In his sinless state, man held joyful communion with him, that is God, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What I like to say is that in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we find a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. A perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. Now, in order to fully appreciate the biblical picture of humanity's restoration, I think it is essential for us to adopt what I call an Eden-to-Eden paradigm of God's ultimate plan. Now, take your Bible and hold it up just like this. Now, it's interesting that we refer to the Bible as a book. It really is not a book. It's more like a compendium of books. It's, it's more like an encyclopedia. How many books are in the Bible, by the way? How many total? Sixty-six. Excellent. How many in the Old Testament? That's right. That's right. And how many in the New Testament? That's right. Good job. Very good. So, in, instead of the Bible being a single book, the Bible is more like an encyclopedia. It's a compendium of books. It was written by some 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years on three different continents by people from a variety of backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses, etc., etc. So, this is more like an encyclopedia than a single volume. Now, what's remarkable is the continuity of the Bible. The, the consistency of the Bible is absolutely incredible. And I'm one of these people that when I first started reading the Bible, it was not easy to understand. Anyone else have that experience? You, there's just certain books of the Bible you think, man, I, I'm just not getting it. I think I'll go back to the Gospel of John, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I have that, free, that experience frequently. In fact, I just happened to open up right now to Ezekiel. And, and I've read Ezekiel through, and I've enjoyed Ezekiel. And there are certainly parts of Ezekiel that I love. You know, a new heart also will I give them, and a new spirit will I put with them, and I will take away the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. I can, I can understand that. But there are things in Ezekiel that, frankly, I read, and I, I just say, what is going on here? Amen. Are you with me? So, so as somebody who does not speak 12 languages fluently like Pastor Diop does, did you know that? Twelve languages fluently. He said, well, you know, I can only teach in ten of them. <laughs> oh, just ten. I feel much better about it now. You know, they say that if you can speak three languages, you're trilingual. If you can speak two languages, you're bilingual. And if you speak one language, you're from the United States of America. <laughs> or Canada, eh? Now, beloved, yeah, but how many people in here speak French? Right here! Okay. Right here. Woo! <laughs> now, how many Canadians in here don't speak a word of French? There you go. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, by the way, I have an excellent French accent. And uh, Jonathan, you come talk to me after. I'll, I'll share with you my excellent French accent, but I don't know much French. Now, now the point here is this. For, for someone like myself, who's a, 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 what I will call a, a lay Bible student, literally, I have no formal theological training, none, which, which is proof positive to me that you don't have to have formal theological training in order to understand the Bible. Can someone say amen? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. As I said the other night, listen, if you have formal theological training, this just gives you a leg up, but you don't have to have formal theological training in order to understand the Bible. In fact, one of my favorite statements from the writings of Ellen White is found in the fifth volume of the Testimonies. I'm just going to quote this for you quickly. She says, The Bible was written for the common person. Listen carefully. I'll, I'll quote it directly. The Bible was written for the common person, and the interpretation given by the common person when aided by the Holy Spirit is the interpretation that most often accords with the truth as it is in Jesus. 
Isn't that interesting? She says it was not written for the scholar alone. And so, beloved, it's so nice that we can come to the Bible and we can understand it. It doesn't mean you understand everything and it doesn't mean you understand it exhaustively, but even a child can understand the themes of the Bible. Can you say amen to that? Now, now, as someone who wants to understand the Bible better, I appreciate contexts that allow me to put the Bible into a big picture. I want to share one of those with you right now. If you hold your Bible up like this, on this end of the Bible, that is the front cover, you, you find in the first two chapters of the Bible a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment, or Eden. What word did I say, everyone? Eden. Eden. Okay? Now, if you come all the way through all 66 books of the Bible and you end up here at the, the back cover and you go this way, two chapters, do you know what you find? A perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people in a perfect environment. That's Revelation 21 and 22. Well, isn't this fascinating? At the very beginning of the Bible, we have Eden, and at the very end of the Bible, we have Eden restored. The message here is easily grasped. God is seeking to restore humanity to the original Eden, and He succeeds by the end of the book. Are you with me, everyone? Yes or no? And, and everything in between, if you'll allow this uh, rather crude, almost colloquial language, everything in between the first two chapters and the last two chapters is God pitching His plan to humanity. God is, is trying to show you where you've come from and where He wants to get you, and these are the stories of people, some of whom accepted that plan and others who didn't, and He's pitching it. He's saying, here it is. I'm holding it out to you. Won't you accept it? Now, more could be said on this, but Eden to Eden. Are we all on the same page, everyone? Eden to Eden. So I would say the overarching theme of the Bible is the restoration of humanity. The overarching theme of the Bible is the restoration of humanity. So, so when you're reading the Bible, keep that in the back of your mind. That's the big picture. It's the restoration of humanity through Jesus Christ. Okay, that's going to help you. That big picture, what, what philosophers call meta-narrative, it's like the umbrella is going to help you and enable you to better understand the Bible. When you get into some of those passages that you don't quite understand, you say, oh, this is understood, at least broadly, against the backdrop of God restoring humanity to Himself. Eden to Eden. Now, more could be said. Now, the Advent, that is the second coming, is the consummate fulfillment of God's plan of salvation. It completes the restoration of man. Man returns to Eden, and this is the goal to fellowship with God, and notice these words here, face to face. Beloved, I said the other night in the sermon that the message of the cross is that God would rather go to hell for you than live in heaven without you. You say amen to that? Uh, in my mind's eye, this is what I see happening as, as Adam and Eve fall there in Genesis chapter 3. Suddenly heaven becomes unattractive to Jesus. His children have fallen. His children are now under the dominion and under the oppression of Satan. And he knows that now they have been infected with a disloyalty that we refer to as sin. By the way, sin is not just a behavior. You need to disabuse your mind of that narrow definition of sin. Sin is a disease. Sin is like a cancer. And sin is inimical to the principles of God's holiness. In fact, if you want to take the essence of sin and distill it down to its most rudimentary element, sin is selfishness. In fact, that's a direct quote from the, from the writings of, the, 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 of, of Ellen White. That's a direct quotation. Sin is selfishness. I can give you another one. This is also a direct quote. Selfishness is sin. Fascinating, isn't it? So, so when, you, when you say sin is selfishness and selfishness is sin, is functions as an equal sign, what it means is the essence of sin is me at the center. Right? Selfishness. This is easy to remember in the English language. S-I-N. P-R-I-D-E. Pride puts I at the center. Look at there at Revelation, pardon me, Isaiah chapter 14. You have Satan, the originator of sin. And what does he say? I will be like the Most High. I will exalt my throne. I, I, I. It's all about me. Friends, ultimately sin at its most rudimentary, at its most foundational level is about me. I. 
at the center. Now, the, the beauty of the character of God is that the cross tells us that the essence of love is others at the center. When Jesus died there on the cross, and, and as far as he knew, this was a terminal experience. He went through with something at significant, even eternal cost to himself for the benefit of others. And so I'm going to go so far as to say the essence of love, that is God's agape love, is selflessness. Do you hear the language there? So the essence of sin is selfishness, me at the center, and the essence of love is selflessness, others at the center. Are you with me on that, yes or no? Are you with me, yes or no? See, we sometimes wonder, uh, we know that God hates sin, but why? It's not because he has arbitrarily or capriciously chosen not to like certain behaviors, hardly. Because, friends, the essence of sin is putting yourself at the center. This is inimical. This is contrary to the very principles of God's nature, his character, his law, and his love. This is why sin can't exist in his presence. And yet God wants to restore himself to face-to-face -face communion. Well, God, friends, frankly, is faced with a very, very difficult proposition. And it goes something like this. The supreme object of God's love is sinners. You with me, yes or no? For God so loved the world. The supreme object of God's love is sinners, but the supreme object of God's hatred is sin. Now, God is in a very difficult situation. The problem is, is that the supreme object of his love, sinners, and the supreme object of his hatred, sin, are inexorably intertwined. They're all wrapped up together. Now, God wants to separate the supreme object of his love from the supreme object of his hatred. How is he going to do that? Because if he doesn't do that, we could never be in face-to-face -face communion with God. That's the point. He has to get sin out of us, away from us, so that we can bear his presence. In fact, look at Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. That's on your screen there. Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. Notice this. You know the story. God has been speaking with Moses on top of Mount Sinai. Moses made a very bold request, and the request was, God, I want to see you. You see that there in verse 18, is it? Exodus chapter 33. Verse 18, he says, please show me your glory. Moses essentially said, God, I want to see you. Moses knew that God could see him, but there on, on Mount Sinai's pinnacle, he could see the thunders or hear the thunders. He could see the lightnings. He could see the smoke. He could see the clouds. God was impervious to him. He couldn't see God, but he knew that he was fully disclosed to God. God could see him, but he couldn't see God. And so he makes this very bold request. God, show me your glory. Show me who you are. God says, all right. I will show you my glory on three conditions. Number one, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. Number two, I'll put my hand over you. And number three, you can only see my back parts. Notice verse 20. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. <laughs> now, I want you to try to step outside for a moment of the holiness of God and try to understand how this would hurt God's heart. Imagine if the person that you loved so much, uh, perhaps a spouse, perhaps a child, perhaps a mother, perhaps a father, that you had been away from, from a, for a terrible time. And, and let's just say for the sake of illustration that this person was in some kind of a quarantine and, and their, their immune system was so reduced to nothingness that, that even the smallest germ or the smallest virus would end their life immediately. And, and so imagine with me here that you can see them. You love this person. Let's just say this is the dearest person to you. And every fiber of your being wants to go and, and open the door and run into that quarantine area and throw your arms around them. But you know that in the process, they'll be killed. They'll die. How would that be? 
You can observe the object of your love and, and, and you, you so want to be with them, you want to be close to them, but you know that in the process it would necessarily engender the death of the object that you love. This is God with Moses. Moses says, I want to see what you're like and, and I can just see God saying, oh, you don't know how I'd like that. You don't know how I'd like that. All right, Moses, we're going to do it. It's going to be dangerous. We're going to have to take precautions. We're going to put you in the rock, Moses. We've got to have you in there. That will mute some of my glory. And then, Moses, I'm going to have to put my hand over you. Even the rock is not going to be sufficient to mute my glory. The hand will have to go over you as well. And, and Moses, as much as you'd like to see me in my fullness, you can only see my back parts. Because Moses, as much as I love you, if you see my face, you will die. Now again, step for a moment outside of God's holiness, outside of His austerity, and, and God told Moses he would die. No, it's, friends, step outside of that. God wants to reveal Himself to Moses, but He knows in the process of it, if He does it in His fullness, it's game over. How does the heart of God feel? Friends, the longing desire of God's heart is to be restored to this Edenic communion with His children. That's why the Bible ends that way. Amen. So He says in plain language in Exodus chapter 33, God, Moses rather, no man can see my face and live. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29, the author of Hebrews goes so far as to say, God is a consuming fire. Well, that's not a very attractive picture of God, is it? I mean, when was the last time you were standing around a consuming bonfire and you just wanted to give it a hug? <laughs> the glory of God to sinners is as a consuming fire. What did the children of Israel, I mean, Moses is on the top of the mount, but what did the children of Israel see at the base of the mount? They saw lightnings and they saw smoke and they saw clouds and they heard the thunderings and the, the magnificently loud, thunderous voice of God. It was terrifying. And all the while, God is wanting to reach out to His children. He wants to see them face to face. God's heart has been breaking ever since that first day when He came into the garden anticipating a, another day with His children. And the Bible records these sad words. And Adam hid himself from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> he hid himself from his dad. I have two boys. Uh, little Landon is almost five, uh, and Jabel is three. He's eight, 18 months younger. And um, they're good boys. Good boys. Lots of energy. Um, just good kids. Rambunctious, yes, but, but good kids. And uh, at times, Papa has to travel. Now, now, I decided early on in my ministry I was not going to sacrifice my family on the altar of ministry period. And so nine times out of ten, my wife and my children travel with me to my speaking appointments. Okay, But there are times when, by our own choice, uh, she chooses to stay home and it's just easier on the kids. Occasionally. This happens to be one of those. Almost always, my family is with me, even if it's to South Africa. My boys went to Africa when they were young, young, young. And uh, my boys just, they go with me. It's rare for me to be apart from my boys, and, and it's hard for them. In fact, my, my wife just told me on the phone yesterday that, that, that Landon, uh, in his most recent prayer, as they were praying for Papa to be safe, he said, he said, when do we get to see Papa again? I want Papa to come home. Now, this boy is so dear to me. It's just, it just incredible. Well, <laughs> when Papa does come home, my boys do this interesting thing. They kind of explode without exploding. 
when they see Papa pulling up in the driveway, and of course it won't happen this time because I get home at midnight tomorrow night, but tomorrow, day after tomorrow morning, these boys are going to come into that room, and when they realize that Papa is in the bed, they just start to go, <laughs> Papa! And they just freak out. I mean, I just can't, and they just start shaking and running, ah, Papa's here! And just, they hit me, and I mean, there's like, they don't know what to do. Their body is just like spontaneously reacting to Papa. I mean, they just freak out. I, I don't know where they get that stuff from. Now, the point here is, it's supposed to be like that. Your kids aren't supposed to run in the opposite direction in fear when you show up. But here's God comes into the garden and says, Adam! Adam! He hid himself from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So ever since that day, God, the longing desire of his heart has been to see his children face to face again. Now, he could do it tonight. But again, it would be an unhappy experience for us. You understanding where I'm coming from here? Now, Jesus showed up, and uh, he enabled us to see God face to face. In fact, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. God had to reveal himself, and an angel was unqualified. Moses was unqualified. Even the prophets were not qualified to reveal God in his fullness. Now, they showed us something of God, no doubt. But when it came time for God to reveal Himself in His fullness, only God was qualified to do it. I love that when Dr. D. said that the other morning. Only God is qualified to reveal God. And so we find Paul here in, in what is probably my top three, one of my top three favorite passages of Scripture in the Newer Testament. We find God, or pardon me, Paul here saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 6, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts... To give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Now, now the language that Paul here is, is drawing from is the language of Genesis. Right? The language of Genesis says, In the beginning God said, Let there be what, everyone? Light. And there was light. And, and so God speaks into this vacuous void of non-existence. And when He speaks, He says, Let there be light. And, and the, the, the physical light, the particulate matter light, the wave light is created. And here Paul grabs that same imagery and he says, the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has now shown in an equally dark and vacuous location. Well, look at the verse and tell me, where is that equally dark, vacuous location? He hath shown in our what? In our hearts. So now we're not talking about literal light. We're not talking about physical light. He says, to show us the light, look at the verse, of the knowledge. What is knowledge? It's understanding. It's what you know. To give us the light of the knowledge of the, of the glory of God. Hey, that's what Moses asked to see. I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And so Paul says, hey, just the same God that spoke in the beginning and said, let there be light into the vacuous void of non-existent space, that same God has now spoken into an equally dark and vacuous location. He's spoken into the heart of humanity. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. And God speaks into our heart. How did the prophet Isaiah say it? He said, darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people. Ellen White in the book Desire of Ages in the, in the chapter on the Incarnation, she says that the earth was dark through a misapprehension of God's character. That is, they didn't know what God was like. They thought that, that God needed to be appeased and so you throw the virgin into the volcano, you, you burn your children in the fire and God is happy. The, the earth didn't have a clue. God has to cut through the miasma. God has to cut through this confusion and so He sends Jesus and now we can see God. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And look at verse 7. Or look at the rest of verse 6. In the face of Jesus. 
Beloved, we know what God is like. Just sit on that for a second. You know what God is like. And it's good news what He's like. We don't have to wonder how God would relate to the sinner. We have it in John chapter 8. Woman, where are thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? No man, Lord. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The woman caught in adultery. We don't have to wonder anymore. We know how God would relate to sinners. How would God relate to someone who used to be on fire and fell away? Peter. We we know how God relates to us now. How? Because Jesus has come and dispelled the darkness. And so in the person of Jesus, we saw God face to face. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. But here's the catch. In Christ, we saw God as a man. This is what is referred to as the incarnation. We talked about this on the second night, the infleshing of God. And so, and so Christ was God, but He wasn't God in His fullness. That is to say, the fullness of His manifestation, of His glory. He was 100% God, but He had to lay aside this and lay aside all of these various divine attributes, His omniscience, His omnipresence, His omnibene, all of these various things to shrink down into a human form. And so when we saw Him, we did see God, but not in His fullness. You're there in 2 Corinthians, look at chapter 3 and verse 18. This is an important verse of Scripture from whence we derive a very biblical principle. Verse 18, but we all with unveiled face. This is actually referring to the experience of Moses coming down from the mountain. He veiled his face, but he says, we with unveiled face, we're beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Notice that phrase again, the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. And it's this verse that that, that enables us to draw this very simple biblical principle, and it goes like this. By beholding, we become changed. Let's say that together. By beholding, we become changed. By beholding, we become what? What does that mean? It means you become like what you look at. This is why David said in Psalm 101, verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Friends, it is precisely this principle that that, that informs, should inform our Christian entertainment and recreation. Friends, you cannot look at a love story where two people are involved in a non-biblical, non-Christian relationship, however loving and sweet and dramatic and triumphant it might be, this is what Hollywood does. You look at that and, beloved, your mind, whether you believe it or not, is being programmed. Are you with me? And you'll, you'll, be, and you'll be changed and suddenly your, your spouse begins to look subpar doesn't look quite as good as the lover in the chick flick, as they say. You watch the violence. Beloved, don't, don't kid yourself. You, you can't look at these things without becoming callous to them in some degree. I have a very simple principle of Christian entertainment, and it goes like this. If I couldn't watch it with Jesus sitting right next to me, I'm not going to watch it. And I got another principle for you. If you're not sure, don't do it. Uh, Just think it through. Uh, There's a story, and I'll just tell it very, very quickly. There's a story of a man. He owned a bank. And he owned two banks. There's a town here, there's a town here, and the, the banks, this is back before the days of cars, and so it was a, there was a carriage, and, and he had to be carried via carriage by horses, and, and he had to go through a mountain pass. So you have a, a bank here and a bank here, 15 miles apart, over a mountain pass, and, and this was a wealthy man, and he had this nice carriage, and these horses brruh, 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 would go over the mountain pass. He had to make the, the, the trip several times in a week, and he had a, a driver who he trusted, and, and that driver knew that mountain pass like the back of his hand, but one day that driver died. And so he had to go find another driver. And he went to town and he, he rustled up a few uh, drivers. He said, you know, stagecoach drivers. I'm looking. Three guys signed up. And he said, all right, I, I, I'm going to hire one of you. But listen, I, I'm an important person and, and I need to get to my places safely. And I need to know that you have excellent skills. 
So here's what we're going to do. Here's my carriage. Here's my horses. I'm going to stand over here. And he took them to the most precipitous area there in the mountains. And he said, I'm going to stand here. And this is the most difficult of the passes. And I want you to show me how close you can get my carriage to the edge without going over. I want to see your skill. I want to see how, how, what's your nerve like. So the first guy gets in the carriage and brruh, 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 he comes kind of cr cruising around and he squeaks that thing over and he gets within about a foot and he's, no, 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 and he pulls it back closer to the wall, the, can't, the wall there. Finishes out the turn. The second guy comes and, and he comes around and, and he was a little more daring and he brruh, 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 and he got it within six inches and all the while the, the owner's watching it and he brruh, pulls it back over. The third guy comes around, but, but he's not moving fast at all. He is creeping along as slow as can be, and he is hugging the inside wall of that precipitous pass. He is as far away from the cliff edge as is possible. He's just barely squeaking around just ever so slowly and safely. And when he gets to the end, the, the owner there gathers the three men together. I want to ask you a question. Who do you think he hired? Yeah, who would you hire? Beloved, don't see how close you can get to the edge without going over. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. So those are two powerful principles of Christian recreation and entertainment. Principle number one, if you know you couldn't watch it, look at it or whatever with Jesus sitting next to you, don't do it. Uh, amen? amen? And the second principle is if you're not sure, it, it could go either way, just wait. What I love to tell people, there's, oh man, I love the Christian rock. Jesus, yeah. And half the time you can't understand what they're saying anyway. And they say, oh, I, 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 my heart is lifted to God. And I say, okay, beloved, just, just follow this line of reasoning here. Let's pretend for a moment that Pastor Asterix wrong. That happens sometimes, by the way. He asked my wife. Let's pretend for a moment the Christian rock is actually okay. And you go, no problem. Let's just say it's okay. When you get to heaven, you say, when you get to heaven, by the way, there are going to be three surprises. The first is that you're there. <laughs> the other two is that you, people you thought were n never make it are going to suddenly be there, and people you were just sure were going to be there conspicuously absent. But as you arrive... Let's just say there's a rock concert over here and it's Lollapalooza in heaven and just bands all just everywhere. And, and you know, I'm going to get there and I'm going to say, well, I, hmm, I guess I was wrong about that. That's what I tell people. You have the rest of eternity to enjoy it, if in fact we're wrong. Why risk it for 20 or 30 years? By the way, you teenagers, you're going to hate that music in 10 years anyway. You're going to hate it in 10, 15 years anyway. So why risk it for a few years? Why risk it if, if in fact, it's, it's golden, if, in fact, it's okay? You listen to it when you get to heaven. Does that make sense? I mean, do you follow that line of reasoning, yes or no? I consider myself to be a reasonably logical person. And, and I finally said, you know, if there was a 1% chance that the sandwich was poisoned, I'm not going to eat it. Are we on the same page? So by beholding we're changed, we should avoid those things that could, could be leading us down the wrong path. And, and, and the, the principle here is that by beholding Christ in His Word, in His what, everyone? In His Word and, and in ministry and in fellowship at events like this, slowly but surely, notice it says from glory to glory. That means incrementally. It means what? Incrementally. We are, we are becoming like Him. Now, sometimes this happens so painfully slowly that we don't perceive it. But friends, I want to give you a piece of, of encouragement here, and that is this. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, He'll take care of the rest. I promise. Amen. Right? You with me? By the way, it's called the Christian walk, not the Christian leap. You with me? I mean, I, I almost felt like when I got baptized, I was like, I thought, well, now you become, like, sin's not attractive anymore. It, it, like, just, boom, you're just super saint all of a sudden, and you tear off your baptismal robe, and there's the super saint sign, right? <laughs> How many other people thought that it would be similar to that? Now, there's a few of you out there, and the rest of you may have felt that way, just don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> Beloved, it's not the Christian leap. It's the Christian walk. Are you with me? That's what the verse says, from glory to glory to glory to glory. 
to glory. We're becoming more like Him incrementally. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you're there in 2 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the love chapter. We talked about this the other day in Sabbath school. Remember that? That was fun. Shannon and Mina there, you know, talking about love. and That was cute. I liked that. By the way, I've been married for seven years, and I still consider myself a newlywed. Amen. It's true. Marriage is fun, by the way. Amen. I tell people life begins at marriage. It took me six weeks, you know. You know how it was. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, Paul says, when I was a little boy, I spoke like a little boy. I understood like a little boy. I thought like a little boy. But when I became a man, I put away those little boy things. Now, notice verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then how will we see everyone? Face. face to face. That's verse 12. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. Now think that through. If you've ever been to one of those church that, churches that have those uh, marbled windows, they're, they're windows and the light comes through the window, but... but they're not, they're not clear. You can't see figures and details on the other side. You can just tell there's a figure over there. Paul, Paul, that's the image that Paul is here conjuring up. He's saying, we look through the, the glass, but it's dimly. He says, but then we're going to see face to face. Now I know in part. He's saying, I, I, what I know about God is about this much. He says, but then I'm going to know this much. Proverbs chapter 4 says that the way of the righteous, verse 18, says the way of the righteous is like, is like the rising sun. It shines more and more and more and more until the perfect day, until high noon. Oh, let's hold on to that. Let's hold on to that. And let's go to our... How do I want to say this? Our operative text in 1 John. And beloved, go to 1 John. This good stuff. This is, this is it. This is the sermon right here. If you've been sleeping, then this is the time to wake up. Nudge that person sitting next to you. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. This, this is incredible, this verse of Scripture. I remember the first time I understood this verse of Scripture, I about jumped out of my chair. The Apostle John says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. What he's basically saying here is, just look at how much God loves us. He's called us His children. And then he says in verse 2, Beloved, now, what's that word, everyone? Now we are the children of God. Notice the present tense. We are the children of God. You can have confidence in Christ. John didn't waffle. He said, we are the children of God. But notice what he says next. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Now, hold on to that. You have this tension in the New Testament. It's a theological tension. It's sometimes referred to as the already not yet tension. How many of you have heard of that, by the way? You've, you've you've, you've, you know that's an interpretive paradigm for the New, New Testament. Already but not yet. Raise your hand, okay? The two theologians, all right, just the two guys. Okay, this is, when you, when you read in the New Testament, you find this as a consistent theme. You find that there are things that have already happened, but that have not yet happened. And that's what, that's what he's saying here. This is a classic illustration of the already not yet paradigm. For example, you could say, tell me if this makes sense to you, I have been redeemed. Are you comfortable with that, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, but are you comfortable with this? I am being redeemed. Is that, is that theologically sound? Yes or no? Okay. And how about this? I will be redeemed. You comfortable with that? Yes or no? So, so, so this is illustrative of the fact that there are parts of the gospel that, that have already happened, but they haven't happened yet. It's the already not yet paradox. And that's what John is saying here. Look at it again. He says, we are the children of God. Can someone say amen? amen. But then he hastily adds, but we don't really know what that looks like. Anyone here been to heaven? Me neither. Do you ever wonder what it's going to be like? You know, I think about it all the time. I used to think about it all the time. 
But then I stopped thinking about it. Do you know why? I don't think we have a clue. I, I don't think that we even have a context to understand it. Why do you find Jesus so many times in the New Testament? You know, his hard-headed disciples are sitting there and he's, he's thinking to himself, man, these guys are dense. I mean, how can I get this through to them? Jesus knew the kingdom of God was so unlike anything that they knew. You found him saying the strangest things. He'd say things like, okay, okay, okay. okay. Listen, guys, all right. The kingdom of heaven is like, it's like, uh, it, it, it was just so hard to try and communicate the kingdom of heaven because it's so foreign to this dark world. The kingdom of heaven is like, it's like, um, Ah, I've got it. It's like a, a mustard seed. And I can imagine the disciples saying, what did he say? I think he said a mustard seed. And, and, and Jesus said, oh, yeah, 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 here it is. The kingdom of heaven is like, it's like, a, it's like a man who's shopping for pearls. All right, Jesus. There's no question that often those disciples didn't have a clue. And the reason that Jesus had to use parables is because it's so unlike anything we've ever experienced. I used to think about heaven all the time. And then I stopped because I thought, I don't have a clue. We don't even have a context. We don't even have the language to begin. We say, oh, I want to I walk on streets of gold. Well, friends, how, come on. How long is that going to be exciting? <laughs> For about 30 seconds. Are you with me? But you're going to live forever. So, so surely the essence of heaven cannot be walking on streets of gold, can it? And, and listen, I want to fly as much as the next guy, but I suppose even flying will get boring eventually. Are you hearing me, yes or no? John here says, we are the sons of God. And he says, but it has not been revealed what we shall be. You know what he's saying? We don't really know what it looks like. I hath not seen, nor ear heard. Neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love Him. That's what I love to tell people. I preached at an academy one time. And uh, I had all these, all these concerned 17-year-old girls coming up to me at this academy, real Lindo Adventist Academy. And, you know, sweet-looking girls, nice girls. There's about six of them. We, we, we need to meet with you privately. Nice girls. I said, oh, okay, let's, we'd like to meet with you in the library tomorrow at noon. Oh, okay, great. So it seemed serious. So we uh, sat down there and, and uh, they sort of had their little counsel and they said, oh, Tiffany, ask him. <laughs> what is it, Tiffany? She says, we want to know once and for all. It's all right. Is there going to be marriage in heaven? I knew where this was going. I said, why do you ask? Well, because, uh, we, you know, everyone says Jesus is coming soon. If there's not going to be marriage in heaven, we only got one shot at this thing. And uh, we do, we're, just, we're just thinking that we need to get to, to, get to work here. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like graduation and weddings, like on the same day at an academy. Some people say to me, you know, when, when I get to heaven, <laughs> it's just not going to be the same if Rover's not there. Is my dog going to be? <laughs> I got a good friend who's a professional surfer, was a professional surfer. And uh, he said to me, you know, tell me about this verse where the Bible says there's not going to be any more sea. <laughs> you know, Scotty enjoys fly fishing. I have a hunch he won't be doing that in heaven. <laughs> now, beloved, listen to me. I don't know what heaven's going to be like. But you know what I do know? You won't be disappointed. You're with me. That's what John is saying. He said, Beloved, right now, right now, tonight, we are the sons of God. But we don't really know what that looks like. Now read the rest of the verse. This is absolutely, totally amazingly incredible. Look at the rest of the verse, verse 2. The rest of the First John chapter 3, verse 2, he says, but we know that when he is revealed, we will be like him for or because we will see him as he is. 
Beloved, what is being described here? The consummate fulfillment of that great truth that by beholding you become changed. Notice what he's saying. We we don't know what it's going to be like, but we do know this. When we see him, we're going to be transformed just like him because we're going to see him like he is. By beholding him in his fullness, we will be transformed. Now, hang on. This is incredible stuff. It snows here, right, in Alberta? (laughs) I know a little bit about snow. I grew up in Wyoming. And um, you'll know what I'm talking about here immediately. You've had those evenings where it started to snow in the evening, late, those big heavy flakes, and and it it snowed all night, and you slept in. I know you don't normally slept in, but this morning you slept in. And it had snowed all night, and there was a, a perfect blanket of snow, an uninterrupted blanket of snow that had just covered everything, and you were in your dark cave of a room with the blinds down, and it was dark there, and, and you, uh, you looked at the clock, oh, you realized you were running late for a meeting or school, you'd overslept, so you quickly take a shower, you throw all your stuff on, and you don't yet know that it has snowed, and you have that perfect blanket of snow just covering everything, and the sun has come out now, and it's just beating down on that blanket of snow, but you're in your rush to get ready, you run out the door, out of your dark house, into this. You ever done that? You ever gone out of a dark room into that, that, that snow that I'm describing, that blanket of white snow with the sun just beating down on it? How many of you know what I'm talking about here? Come on, Canadians. <laughs> you know what? It can burn your eyes. I've done that many times and gone out. Whoa, 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 whoa. You do this thing. Oh, yeah. You wait for the adjustment. Are you with me? What's happening? Listen, don't miss this. You're going from darkness... To bright light. Now, what if, what if, what if, follow the illustration here, what if you woke up on time and uh, you, you walked into the, the adjacent room and you turned the blinds a little bit and the sun was just coming up and you sat down and you read. You went into the kitchen and the sun is now high in the sky and, and you open the blinds and the sun is coming through the windows and, and you make yourself a little food and you're walking around your lighted house. Now, it's not as light as outside but it's lighter. And what you've done is you've gone from a a dark room to a a room that's a little brighter, to a room that's a little brighter yet, to a room that's a little brighter yet, to a room that's a little brighter yet, and sure enough, it's time to go, and you go walking outside into that brightness. Do you know what happens? You just walk right into it. Why? What's the difference? You had become acclimated. You had adjusted. You hearing me? Are you hearing me? Now, beloved, don't miss this. The very essence of the gospel is restoration. John says, hey, we're we're the children of God, but we don't know what that looks like yet, but we do know this. When we see him, we're going to be like him because we're going to see him like he is. Now, beloved, if we want to see God then, like He is, and live, we're going to have to start adjusting to the things of God here. You hear me? Because the Bible says that the Antichrist will be destroyed with the brightness of His coming. In other words, He's burned up by the glory of God. Listen to me. When I was a boy... They had this absolutely terrible soft drink called Tab. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? The stuff was the most putrid, disgusting excuse for a, mo- a product I'd ever tasted. And my, my mom used to drink it, and, and there'd be no soda in the house. I grew up drinking soda, and, and I'd look in there, and there'd be a, t- a warm Tab. I'd say, oh, mercy. I tried it. This must have happened ten times. And I'd and say, and I'd just throw it out. It's just so gross. My mom came in and she said, why is there a full tab can here in the garbage? And I'd say, Mom, that stuff is so nasty. Now listen to what she'd say. She'd say, it's an acquired taste. Guess what, beloved? Holiness is an acquired taste. We're not going to love the things of God in heaven if we don't love the things of God here. 
I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced that if we, if we are surrounding ourselves with darkness here, if, if we love to go to these rated R movies and we love to surround ourselves with darkness here and we are acclimated to darkness, when God shows up, it's going to be just like walking out of that dark house into that bright, bright uh, snow uh, with the sun beating down on the snow. And friends, it's not going to be a happy experience. But if by the grace of God we are being transformed from glory to glory to glory, if we are coming to appreciate incrementally the holiness of God being transformed into His image, we're coming to love the things of God and hate the things of the world so that, so that through a process, so what word did I say everyone? A process, we are coming to leave behind the things of the world and appreciate the things of God. We're leaving behind the lust of the flesh. We're leaving behind the lust of the eyes. We're leaving behind the pride of life. We're leaving behind sensuality and all of those various things. And we are embracing the things of God. Then when God shows up, we're going to see Him. As he is. Face to face. Friends, don't miss this. If we're not coming to appreciate the things of God in the here and now, we're not going to suddenly love them in heaven. I love to surf. Anyone here love to surf? Any Albertans love to surf? There's a surfer. I, if, if I had to give up every one of the things I love to do, I'd give up every one of them if I could keep surfing. Sur, uh, surfing is what I love. It's my favorite thing. Now, I live in Michigan, and uh, the Lord Jesus and I, we talk about this frequently, and I'm, I'm, it's okay to be there for now, but I, I tell you, I miss the ocean. I'm a surfer. I had this idea a bunch of us Christian fellows, we go on a surf trip together, yearly surf trip. For those of you who surf, you want to come? We're going to go to Indonesia. It's a Christian surf trip. You're in. And uh, last year it was to Costa Rica, and we had this idea. I had this idea. My brother wants to learn to surf. Now, my brother is my big brother, but he's my younger brother. He's huge. He loves to party. He loves the hard life, and uh, he's a good guy. I love him so much. But he's not a Christian. has no need for the things of God. So I, I got this idea, I'll invite my brother to come on the surf trip. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Because there's going to be like, you guys know Matt Parra. Matt Parra's going to be there. My friend Scott Higgins is going to be I'm going to be, it's going to be, there's going to be four of us Christian brothers, and I'm going to invite my brother to come surfing with us, and I'm thinking it's going to be a missionary trip. In fact, that's actually how I justified the expense. I said to my wife, sweetie, I got to go. <laughs> I mean, come on, this is my brother's So I have to go. She said, you're right, you go. And I was like, yes. <laughs> Woo, surf trip. So my brother comes. My brother comes, and I'm thinking, this is going to be incredible. We will have him in our clasp for one full week of Christian surfing extravaganza. He's going to love it. He'll be converted, and he'll be baptized. We'll baptize him right there in the Pacific Ocean. And I had this whole thing planned out, but you know what happened? There's no doubt that seeds were planted, but after about day three, when we got to the Sabbath, he wants to go surfing and we want to go to church. Things went downhill from there. He found some other friends there in the local town. He's staying out late. We're getting up at, you know, the crack of dawn to, to, to go out surfing, hit the brakes early while the water's still glassy. He's getting up at the crack of noon because he's drinking. You want to know what happened? He, he couldn't have appreciate the company. He, he, he felt uncomfortable around us. We went out of our way to make him not feel uncomfortable, but there was no swearing, there was no drinking, there was no girls, there was no parting. He, he, beloved, God's not going to kick you out of heaven because he doesn't love you. He's going to do you a favor. He's going to say, oh, you know what? Wow. I just... I just don't think you're going to like it here. You hear me? You know, I, I, I appreciate that you really enjoy fill in the blank, but, you know, we don't do that here. I, I just don't think you'd like it. In fact, it'd be torture for you. We will exclude ourselves from heaven by our own choices and by our own affinities. 
You hearing me? Yes or no? But friends, we can prepare ourselves for heaven all the while standing in the righteousness of Christ. I want to say that again. We can, we can be prepared for heaven by the Spirit all the while standing with total confidence in the righteousness of Christ, never in our own righteousness. Can someone say amen? amen? I mean, beloved, you are accepted right now in the beloved. That's what John says. He says, now we are the sons of God. I couldn't go on if I didn't know that right now I was saved. If I died right now, I have confidence in Christ that I would be saved. You, you, how can you even begin the Christian walk if you don't have present confidence that you are saved because of who Christ is, not because of who you are? And all the while in that living confidence in Christ, by His power, by His grace, and by His Spirit, we are laying aside the things of the world. We're getting the victory here and the victory here. Again, not in our own power, in His power, His strength being made perfect in weakness so that when we get to that day when Christ appears in the clouds and we see Him as He is, we will not be consumed, but we will say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. Amen. Beloved, holiness is an acquired taste. Our final verse is Revelation chapter 22. Go look at it. It's incredible. I've read it, oh, I don't know, a hundred and... 50 times, maybe more, I don't know. Every time I read it, I just look at it. I just say, there it is. It's right there. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit for the month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. Now notice verse 4. And they shall see his face. Now, it doesn't say it. It doesn't say it there, but I'm going to add two words. I'm just going to add them. You give me permission to do that? It doesn't say it, but it's implied. And they shall see his face and live. What did God say to Moses? No man shall see my face and live, but it's clearly... They will see his face and they'll live. Beloved, the very essence of the gospel is restoration. The very essence of the gospel is restoration. God longs to be restored to face to face communion with his children. I'm one of these people that loves life. Amen? So much better than the alternative. I just have this feeling that God has some very cool stuff prepared for us in heaven. I, I, I just don't think any preacher could even begin to... to, to, to what are you going to say? I don't know what it's going to be like, but I know Jesus is going to be there. Amen. Beloved, I, w I want to go to heaven. I'll just put all my cards right out on the table. I'll just put them right out there. We're going, Scotty. But I, I just have this sense that we better start loving the things of heaven now. We had a question in the question answer time. You know, what, what's this probation thing? Well, don't, probation is all about learning to love the things of heaven. That's it. Now, I know Joe's going to make an appeal tomorrow morning. I'm looking forward to that. But uh, tonight, I want to make an appeal. Now, if I ask you how many of you want to see God face to face, you'd all respond and say, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, oh, yeah. That'd be too easy, be too trivial, be too trite. But, but how many of us have things in our lives that we know, we just know, are not going to be in heaven? And we're hanging on. But, but, but what does it look like for you to let it go? What, what does that look like? for you to, to give God permission 
to get you ready for heaven? What does that look like? Does your life suddenly disappear? Does everything come crashing in around you? Does life cease to have meaning? Is really? I mean, what does it look like? Beloved, I want to see Jesus face to face. And, I, and I'm just wondering here tonight, maybe, maybe you're like that. I'm going to venture a guess that many of you are. And uh, I think there, there might be someone here tonight who, who has something that God is saying to them right now, you know what? This is the time. It's time to let that go. And uh, you want to lay that on the altar tonight. doesn't mean you're ready to go to heaven tonight. What it means is it's another step. So if that, if that describes you, maybe you'd like to get up there and just tickle those ivories if you'd like. Just anything, whatever. Who can do it? Somebody get up there. God bless you, sister. And um, maybe, you could, maybe you could play that song face to face. Face to face, nice and slow. We're going to have a special prayer. Where's Pastor Eitner? I love the way that brother prays. Where are you at, Joe? Why don't you come up here and pray for those of us who are going to come forward. So if, if that's you, if that's you, you got something you need to, uh, you, you, you know is not going to be in heaven. God says, Tonight, this is your time. Why don't you come forward right now and do that? Come kneel with, with me here. You got a microphone? This would be the time right now to come forward. The very essence of the gospel is restoration. Pastor Joe is going to pray for us. And uh, Joe, why don't you give us a time of silence there, somewhere in that prayer where we can talk to the Lord in our hearts and, and uh, say what we need to say tonight. You just keep playing. That sounds so nice. And if while Joe's praying, the Spirit of God speaks to your heart, you, you come right up for sure. All right. Almighty God, your name is Jehovah Jireh, a God who sees and a God who provides. Your name is Jehovah Shalom, a God of peace. Your name is El Shaddai and Adonai, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, within the last four days, we know that we have encountered you. Amen. And so, Lord, as we come before your throne tonight, we come pleading the blood of Jesus. Mm that was shed for us almost 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross. We plead his blood because by his blood we have a new and living way now to come before the throne of grace. Amen. And we claim that promise of Hebrews 4.16 that says, come boldly before the throne of grace where you might find mercy and obtain grace to help in a time of need and oh God this is our time of need Amen. and so Lord as we approach your throne boldly tonight oh we recognize Lord how worthless and how sinful we are That's right. but Lord there is a promise 
where your word says that if we would confess our sins, he being Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. That's right. Amen. And so here we are, oh God, in our sinful state, though we be pleading the blood of Jesus and his righteousness for us. And here we are, Lord, saying that we want to see the face of Jesus. We want to see your face. Amen. In peace. So, Lord, as we bow here now on bended knee, I would ask that you listen, Lord, and you hear the petitions of your children. As they now lift them up to you silently. Lord, as we come tonight, we are just petitioning you for your help. Lord, we're, as I've already said, we're sinful and we recognize our unrighteousness. Mm. Your word says that none is righteous. No, not one. Mm. None understands. None knows you. None seeks after you. Our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags in your eyesight. Mm. We don't even desire you, Lord, in our flesh. And so we need your help. That's right. That's exactly right. And so in the name of Jesus, I pray for the blood of Jesus mm. to cover your children tonight. Amen. Please, Father. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit to come now in a double portion because you say that as many as received you to them, mm. you gave power to become the sons of God. Amen. Even as many as believed on your name. Mm. And so, Lord, we claim this power tonight. To conquer the flesh. Amen. We claim this power tonight. To be covered with the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. We claim this power tonight. To have the eye salve of Jesus so that we can see you right. Tonight we claim the power. That we might be able to hear his voice. Our shepherd that calls his sheep. Lord, tonight we claim this power that we might be able to walk right, that we might be able to talk right, that we might be able to act right, that we would do these things because we don't want the world. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We don't want or desire the things of this world, but we want to only be like Jesus. Amen. And so in the name of Jesus, God, I pray that you would send your power in this place as you did with your disciples in the book of Acts and, and that you would send power for us to want to have victory and desire it and that we would have it now. In fact, some of us, Lord, right here in this place are struggling with sin. Hmm. Things that, that have us bound, addictions that have us bound, pet sins that have us, we sleep with it, we, we eat with it, we wake up with it, and we don't know how to let it go. We want to let it go, but we don't know how. Jesus, deliver us tonight. Amen. Lord, you said if any man be in Christ, mm. he is a new creature. Yes. So tonight, oh God, make us new creatures. Amen. 
Take away the, our past, those old things, Lord. Take away the sin that does so easily beset us. Take away the things that the devil uses to haunt us, oh God, mm. that he reminds us of, that we just can't shake. It causes us to toss and turn at night. We cry because we remember where we have been. Cleanse our minds tonight. Remove these things from us. Amen. Give us victory. Make all things new. Hmm. Heal our bitterness. Heal our pain. Heal our sorrow. Heal our broken families. Heal our broken relationships. Hmm. Heal our brokenness, Lord, tonight. We believe it now. That's right. And we trust you for it. And we claim it mm. in the only name that is worthy. The only name under heaven by which we might be saved. Mm -hmm. That's right. By the name and the blood of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. This meeting was produced by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.com. Our address is Hope Media Ministry, P.O. Box 752, Ada, Michigan, 49301. You can also email us at hope at hopevideo.com. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.com. That's hopevideo.com.